السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين ورعنا الله عدائهم أجمعين Today we have Sister Saber joining us who is also a part of our podcast team السلام عليكم Sister Saber عليكم السلام برضي علي How are you? الحمد لله I'm good uh, How are you? I'm doing very well thank you uh, The topic for today will be the inspiration of Fatima al-Zahra صلوات الله عليها So what is your uh, connection? To Fatima, Every Shia has a very unique connection to Fatima, peace be upon her. But especially the women, and me, of course, being a woman myself, um, there's a deeper connection to her history, what she went through, her family relations, and especially her modesty. And my connection with her started not too long ago. It was about two years ago. When I recently found out about her martyrdom, how she passed away and who actually were the murderers, which tends to be hidden a lot from us Shias these days, just because for the sake of unity or pleasing the outside or whatnot. I feel like a lot is hidden from us, which can become a problem when truly understanding Fatima, peace be upon her, because to us she tends to be just the daughter of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, or just the wife of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And I feel like she is much more than that. She is a strong woman. She is courageous. She stands up for what she believes in. She is a backbone of her spouse. And as narrations state that she was like the mother to her own father. So I think creating this connection with her, we are able to learn much more than just, you know, her family relations and whatnot. Uh, I see you brought up the martyrdom of uh, Fatima al-Zahra, alayhi uh, salam. Why do you think they uh, hide it for the sake of unity? Why don't they just uh, make it known who the murderers are and how she died? There was definitely a time where we did have to keep quiet about names for example but i believe we live in a time where you're freely able to express your beliefs speak about the hidden truth the reason that i think it's hidden is because the world tends to make the situation of her martyrdom not as great as it is if you really think about it nowhere in history have we come across a martyrdom as deep as hers where her ribs were broken she lost her fetus and these were all done by the so-called followers of the prophet peace be upon him and his family and we can name them they're omar abu bakir and the other people such as Qunfuz, their continuous disobedience to the prophet peace be upon him and his family tend to link on to his daughter and also imam ali peace be upon him as well and i think it's about time that we do speak up about her about what she went through, because if we don't, there's a big chunk of history and a big oppression that we are putting upon Muhammad and Al Muhammad, peace be upon them all. Uh, why do you believe that there was a time of taqiyya about this topic? And why do you believe that it's a taboo to speak about it? There's obviously criteria to living under taqiyya. They did live under rulers who had able to actually gather followers through luxuries or money and riches and uh, imams didn't have many loyal followers for example if we take imam ali peace be upon him he had about four followers if i remember correctly despite the big event of ghadir where over hundreds and thousands of people witnessed that he was a successor and he should be followed but at the end of the day he only had about four and it was pretty much the same story with the rest of the imams, peace be upon them, where they didn't have many true followers, that they would you know, betray them either through riches or other means. But I don't see that happening today. Do you see any of that happening today? I feel like we have no need to live under taqiyya. Uh, I don't exactly see taqiyya. What I see is more uh, ignorance from our own Shias when it comes to this. And uh, I feel like they... Uh, kind of ignore our uh, our stance on the topic, our hadith, mm-hmm. and they rely more on the uh, Bekri sources, you can say. Uh, interesting that you did brought up the 
Bakri or the Sunni sources, um, because if you really look into it, we have narrations in their own books. For example, Tabari, we have Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba, where it does state the martyrdom of Lady of Heaven, peace be upon her, or at least the fact that Omar threatened her. And that alone should be enough of a reason for you to completely disassociate from, from the yeah, likes exactly. of Omar. Correct. Exactly. And obviously the famous hadith um, in their Sahih books that says, you know, Fatima, peace be upon her, died angry with Abu Bakr and that she didn't allow any of them to attend her funeral. And it's just at this point, it's just the own person's responsibility to dig into these things. It's, it's right in front of our faces. I feel like just open a book right next to you and it's it's there. It's not like it's just a Shia narrative or anything. And as Shias, we need to, we need to stop compromising our beliefs just to please the opposition. We've done that for too many years, to be honest with you. And don't forget the hadith where the Prophet says, uh, thought is a part of me, whoever angers her has angered me. Perfect, exactly. But moving on to the uh, next topic, you can say, um, what is the thing that inspires you the most about Fatima Zahra? Uh, well, there's obviously many things that we can learn from her, but the two main things is that she spoke up about the truth and the oppression that was done to her, her family, her father, for example, as well, without, without you know, minding what the consequences are to her own self, as in she put uh, importance of truth for herself, as obviously there's another narration that states um, she was a type of woman that would put her neighbors before her own self. It's not a surprise that she would obviously put the truth and the need to keep Islam alive. And that is something that I look up to her every single day, which is why I decided to, you know, start this account, for example, and be a part of this amazing team and speak up about what truly happened to her. Because if we don't, then she's passed away in vain. She was killed in vain. She lost her fetus in vain. And what greater oppression is there than her, you know, being murdered and we keep in silent because you choose to suppress the truth, you choose to suppress her injustice that's done to her as well so i think in regards to that i definitely look up to her uh courage bravery the way that she has stood up despite being a woman and you know continuing the message of her father in a way as well so you would say the thing that inspired you the most about fatima zahra islam was the fact that she stood up against the oppression Correct, of yeah. uh, the family of the prophet it is correct and it's, it's a bit irritating in a way for someone like me who i guess knows her story knows what she went through that people still choose to keep it silent while they are out here for example cursing different um countries or putting them down yeah, and constantly like posting they... about their oppression when you know if you're gonna curse the current situation you might as well curse the roots of it does that make sense as in yeah that makes perfect sense like uh, i always see them cursing uh, yazid or cursing muawiyah but they hesitate to curse the uh, yeah you think about who appointed caliph. who appointed yazid muawiyah who appointed muawiyah and they just it's like yeah it all goes back to Saqif. exactly sacrifice the roots of all of it that, that's the thing that kind of and with me the most like you see them cursing all these others, but why don't you curse them? And some of them, they don't even uh, uh, go against Aisha, for example. Uh, Sayyid Aisha, and <laughs> praising her, and she is the wife of the Prophet. And that's that's honestly a whole different topic that we can definitely yeah. get into. But I'll just I'll just say one thing, you know, um, everybody knows that. In the Quran, it's been mentioned, you know, the previous prophets' wives, Prophet Nuh and Prophet Lut, uh, peace be upon them. And they have been put as an example for Aisha and Hafsa. Mm -hmm. But obviously, our main topic is Aisha, so I'll just continue with that. And people tend to say, well, those were the wives of, you know, other prophets, and the final prophet is higher than all of them. It can't be compared. But then again, if that's the case, why would why would God put them as an example? It obviously means that God is trying to 
teach us from previous stories and previous prophets that no, in fact, being a wife has absolutely no merits unless you live up to it. So, um, what are your thoughts on uh, the new movie that just came out, The Lady of Heaven? What I can say is if the opposition can make a whole series about the killer of Fatima, peace be upon her, why are we so irritated about the fact that there's a movie made about the Lady of Heaven showing how she passed away and showing who killed her? With historical sources. As well. Correct. The, I believe the, the creators did say that anybody who has a problem with this, they can come forth and we'll give them sources from both both Sunni books and both Shia books as well. So there's no problem there, but definitely needed something like this. You know, in the world that technology is evolving all the time, the best place to learn, I guess, is visually through movies and lectures in a way but if you don't want to sit through like a two-hour lecture then this movie is i guess a great starting point for you did you see the um, reaction of that one brother after he saw yeah. the movie it was how insane. did you feel i i can a hundred percent understand what he's going through because it was very similar to when i first found out about her martyrdom and in a way you can't help but feel frustrated because you live all these years and you go to majalis of Muharram, Ashura and everything and they're freely talking about how Imam Hussain, peace be upon him, was killed, who killed him, the exact timing, the exact way that he passed away, the details and everything before, during and after. Yet we can't spare a majalis to speak about how mother passed away who killed her how she passed away and everything and for that reason i think that brother was also emotional because it was hidden from him and he's also frustrated that why people don't talk about it so often which is of course what me yourself and many other shias feel as well so in that term i can 100 percent understand i can feel exactly what he's feeling we also have a um hadith from Bekri sources as well as uh, Shia sources, you can also find it, where the Prophet says, um, "The most beloved to my family, of my family, to me is Fatima." How do you reflect on that hadith? How do you view that hadith? And what do you think is the meaning behind it? Being one of the four heavenly women, you know, you can only expect that she would be the most beloved to him. You know, the fact that we tend to ignore her oppression is ignoring the oppression of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. So I have pretty much nothing else to say because the Hadith speaks for itself and we need to honor yeah. her, honor her name, her father and what she went through. And uh, I also want to get your opinion on uh, this Hadith if that's okay, where the Prophet ﷺ says, uh, on, the, on the day of judgment, a caller will call out, lower your gaze until Fatima has passed. Beautiful. She was such a pure, innocent and modest lady that no eye is even given the permission to look at her past. And the Hadith is perfect in describing, as I said, her modesty and everything. And I can't help but think that because of the fact that we neglected her, we don't even have the face to really look at her, for example. Because if you think of the time that she was being killed, all of the people that were against her were the so-called followers, right? And when you look mm -hmm. at the time now, the only people that are truly speaking up about what happened to her are the ones that are getting shut down, that are getting called MI6, that are getting called British spies, or that are getting called... Uh, people who are creating fitna and that tends to come from our own shias unfortunately but you know, at the end of the day we are daughters and the sons of fatima peace be upon her and it's our duty to speak about her that any censorship but of course that doesn't mean you go up to any sunni and start cursing him out or cursing you know people who look up to have debates have discussions about it have be you know be have your akhlaq at the same time but don't suppress and don't ever compromise your beliefs because if Fatima peace be upon her didn't then you shouldn't either
Yeah, that's something I completely agree on. If we're going to have a debate with uh, someone who follows the so-called Sunni sect, then uh, we should keep it respectful so that they don't curse our imams or our of Lady Fatima, alayhi salam. It's a time and place for everything. But also we need to understand the difference between salting and cursing because when we curse, it's a it's a dua, right? That we ask God to remove his remove mercy this from mercy. them. But if you're gonna go out of your way and just insult them, like you know, calling them names and unnecessary at some points, then that part I can kind of understand that provokes them to then curse our side. But there's absolutely mm. nothing wrong with you know sending Lana or anything like that. I believe we should send Lana. We were we were told to send Lana. We were told in the Quran, the Hadiths, everything curse the Munafiqeen or in a way also expose them, humiliate them even if you need to. But if our Hadiths, our Imams, peace be upon them, tell us to do something, who are we to you know make it haram, make it forbidden or anything? Yeah, because we do have a uh, Hadith where it says that Al Jawad alayhi salam he would curse. Omar ibn al-Khattab, whenever he was mentioned in his uh, presence. And he also said that uh, curses be upon those who abstain from doing it, basically cursing him and doubting his property. Ah, uh, exactly. That's what I'm saying. And that also links to another hadith that we have where uh, one of the Im- imams, peace be upon him, also cursed them after each prayer, right? Yeah, because yeah, it is a dua. Yeah, and uh, also the Prophet himself. Uh, when he talks about the hypocrites and those who fled from the battles. And we all know who fled. We, do we need to say who? We all know who fled. <laughs> yes. Why do you think that the Sunnis, or the so-called Sunnis, have uh, uh, degraded Fatima, alayhi salam, you can say, made her seem like any other normal companion or any other normal woman? Um, the best way we can really answer that is back to the roots they can so easily degrade and defame his father, peace be upon him, and his family. So what stops them from defaming his own daughter? And we also can't forget the fact that how many hadiths or how many times has she been mentioned in the Sunnis, or as you said, so-called Sunni sects in their books or even in their lectures or anything, um, despite the fact that even in their books, she's one of the four heavenly women and I believe that a lot of the reason of that is because Aisha has over, overpowered her in their books. And Fatima, peace be upon her, is the true source of knowledge compared to Aisha. So if you put all your focus on that, you're, of course, going to neglect the true source of knowledge and the true lady of heaven. So in a way, you can't blame them because if they're going to the fame he his her father there is absolutely no stopping them from defaming her daughter uh, son-in-law cousin uh, grandsons and so on and so forth so it all just goes back to that they also have a hadith in uh, majma al zawaid volume 9 page 202 where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says to fatima alayhi salam fatima is not like the woman of the children of Adam. Why do you believe that they have uh, ignored this hadith and they don't implement it in this in their daily lives? So or they don't even... Some of them probably uh, reject this hadith completely uh, or haven't even heard of it. Anything that praises the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, they tend to quickly reject or not take seriously. And that all just comes down to ignorance, you know. If anything puts um, the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, above Mother Aisha or Umar or Abu Bakr or anything like that, then they often tend to ignore it, not speak about it. The youth, for example, they get their information from YouTube mostly, you know, the Sheikh of YouTube, should I say. And a lot of them don't mention them. A lot of them, most of them, if not all of them, don't mention them. So ignorance plays a part, but if they do find these narrations and they do look into it, then they dig dig deeper, you know, the ones that are serious about finding the truth. They dig deeper and they find the true people that we need to follow, which is, of course, Fatima, peace be upon her, and her sons and her husband, of course, peace be upon all of them. But they tend to neglect it just as they neglected Ghadir, of course. 
that one day was enough for them and it's fine because expected because if they follow a man who disobeyed the prophet of god peace be upon him and his family and rejected single pen for him to write what he wanted to write and of called him delirious delirious yeah his followers are only just gonna follow in his footsteps aren't they whereas we have the likes of Imam Ali alayhi salam and the following 11 Imams, peace be upon them. And of course, um, Fatima, peace be upon her as well. And that's why we we follow the path of truth. We follow the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, and let's also not forget how they uh, completely change the tafsir of uh, Quran 33, 33, the verse of purification. When it carries us in Sahih Muslim or Kitab Fadal al-Sahaba, that the Prophet ﷺ said the verse of purification was revealed concerning five people. Myself, Imam Ali alayhi salam, Hassan alayhi salam, Al-Hussein alayhi salam, and Fatima alayhi alayha. And um, a lot of them tend to say that, well, um, Aisha is also part of the Ahlul Bayt or whatnot. Um, I don't know where they get this information from. Even so, it completely contradicts what Um Salama, peace be upon her, said as well, that she blatantly asked if the wives are part of the Ahlul Bayt and the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, blatantly said no. No sugarcoating, nothing, just no. And this is in their books as well. Yeah, I see a lot of um, people sugarcoating, especially the burning of the house that has been very, uh, pretty much uh, ignored, we can say, by both sects. Well, you know, the Sunnis can say anything they want at the end of the day even if we just say the name Ali they tend to get a little bit triggered and it's as if the world is crashing in or something a little bit triggered very triggered <laughs> honestly like for example me when I post um, something that's not controversial at all and it's just for example his praise or his virtues oh shirk oh kafir majusi and everything and the what basis are you saying these insults at the end of the day you need to back up your claims but anyways going back to the topic um yeah it shouldn't affect us shias what the sunnis have to say about our beliefs because at the end of the day we know that we follow the correct path and we know that this is the path that will get us to jannah inshallah and people are going to be talking from left right center and everywhere so if we just you know, keep our heads held high, follow the path of Ahlul Bayt, then we'll be rising and rising through generations and so on. Uh, yeah, we can even use their own source as proof of this when uh, the Prophet wasallam said, follow the Quran and my Ahlul Bayt. Ahlul Bayt, of course. And they tend to change that to follow the Quran and Sunnah. Apparently Ali well, is his friend as well. Yeah, yeah, of course he he gathered all those people just to say <laughs> And the Ali heat of the sun. But the funny not funny, interesting part is that the sermon says that God is my Mawla, right? And I am the Mawla mm-hmm. of all the believers. Whoever I am the Mawla of, then Ali is the Mawla of. So if you translate this, God is my friend. I'm the friend of every believer, whoever I am their friend, Ali is his friend. Which doesn't make sense because why would you gather a hundred thousands of people just to say that God is my friend, I'm your friend, and just so you know, Ali is also your friend. Don't forget that I'm saying this under the scorching heat of the sun in a desert, desert. inconveniencing hundreds of thousands of people for this very normal, yeah, very normal discussion, very normal speech. And um, why do you think that Fatima got the nickname Al Zahra, which means basically the shining one. I mean, she is the lady of heaven, isn't she? She was glowing with purity, and of course, we know that she was also made out of light. Yeah, Allah even made the heaven underneath her feet. Her being a part of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, should be more than enough. Should be more than enough for you to neglect everybody else that opposes her and follow her. Even so, even if Fatimiyah didn't happen, and even if Omar didn't pick the door and completely, you know, murder her, um, just that little argument, you need to pick your side. Are you gonna be with the one who goes against part of you know, the Prophet, or are you gonna be the one who is the part of the Prophet? You know, at the end of the day, you have to answer these questions yourself. Are you going to be okay with that? Because if you don't start questioning now, there will come a time where you won't even have the ability to question these things. 
Yeah, and there's even uh, there's many verses in the Quran as well that basically prove the uh, wilaya, for example, <laughs> like Surah uh, Al Maidah, verse fifty-five, or the um, Ayat at Tahir, which we went through earlier. Beautiful. But the one that I kind of wanna focus on, you can say, is the verse uh, forty-two twenty-three. We see, we see that it says. Uh, Say, I do not ask of you any reward for it, but love for my near relatives. And whoever earns good, we give him more of good therein. Surely Allah is forgiving, grateful. Beautiful. And um, when the Sunni sect says that Ahlul Bayt, for example, or not Ahlul Bayt, but the Imams are not mentioned in Quran and all that. What is your thoughts on this verse? It's a very, very beautiful verse that connects perfectly with many of the hadiths that the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family also said as well, which begs the question, why is the Ahlul Bayt mentioned so much? And why is it, why is the need for their love so important? Obviously, there is a clear reason for it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions it and the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his purified family also mentions it. It should be more than enough for us to completely disregard other side, for example, certain Sahabas, and take the family because ultimately the Prophet puts Quran and Ahlul Bayt, which is the two things you need. With without Quran, you will go astray. Without Ahlul Bayt, you will also go astray. So there is a reason that he's mentioned those things, and it's beautiful because they're both linked to each other. You've seen the mentioned in the Quran, for example, um, the verse of Mubahala, obviously, and the verse of Kisa, and of course, um, Ghadir with the Walaya, any other verses, of course, that I can't remember off the top of my head right now. But at the end of the day, it's been stressed so much. And who is the only ones that have held on to the, you know, the speech of Allah and the message of the Prophet as well? It's the Shias. We're the only ones. And if people like to say that, well, you shouldn't call yourself Shias, just call yourself Muslims, then uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it because the word Shia itself has been mentioned in the Quran. And we're proud to be Shias of Ali, peace be upon him. So, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, exactly. Yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Yeah, and I want to go back to when you mentioned the verse of Mubahala. Like, as we know, like, this verse was revealed, pretty important historical event, or actually a very important historical event. And we see that he says, um, our woman and your woman. Mm -hmm. Now, if the wives were a part of Ahlul Bayt, as they like to claim, wouldn't this uh, probably mention one of the wives instead of mentioning yeah, the Prophet? Yeah, that's a very, very good point, yeah. And... I think Mubahala is one of the biggest um, evidences that we do have in history that proves Dahl al-Bayt as well. Um, the fact that, of course, Imam Ali alayhi salam is mentioned as the nafs of the Prophet himself, um, mm. which means if you look at the you know, Battle of Jamal, for example, it's the nafs of the Prophet versus Aisha. You're going to choose the nafs of the Prophet. And then we look at Fatima, peace be upon her, and she's been described as a woman, and if you look at the event of Fatimiya, of course, you are going to side with one that's represented as our woman, right, instead of the opposition. And so on with the um, our sons being Imam Hassan and Imam Hussain, peace be upon them as well. Um, of course, with Imam Hussain, alayhi salam, um, you have the Battle of Karbala, which Yazid, we don't even, we reject completely. A lot of Sunnis do as well. So obviously you they don't curse him. They don't curse it. him. You know, in their books, it, they're not even allowed to curse Satan. So any other battles and events in history, which clearly goes back to this one event in history of Mubahala that said you're supposed to speak. And even with, you know, the Battle of Jamal, there's hadiths with them that says that God is putting you to test whether you follow the Prophet or you follow Aisha, or is it that you follow God or you follow Aisha, something like that. How do you believe that the Battle of Karbala or the Battle of Jamal connects to the death of Fatima Zahra, alayhi salam? We look at it and we see who appointed these people with the event of Karbala as in 
um, as I mentioned before as well. So he can obviously connect it to the people who murdered the mother and then the people who appointed the murderers of the son. And then we look at the battle of Battle of Jamal, you said, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Battle of Jamal, obviously, again, um, we look at who was connected to Aisha, for example, Abu Bakr, one who ordered killing of Fatima, peace be upon her. So no matter how you look at it, it will connect. And let's not forget when um, Abu Bakr, for example, stole the land of Fedak. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah, so if you look at the actual, you know, reasoning behind why he decided to do that, there's absolutely no reasoning, except for the fact that Sunnis tend to say that, you know, what it was left and whatever is left from the Prophet, we tend to give to charity. And what right does Abu Bakr um, choose to steal the land from her when it was gifted to her, in fact? And even, let's say that, you know, um, it was somehow left behind for Fatima, peace be upon her. It clearly mentions that the Prophet, in the Quran, it clearly mentions that Prophets can leave inheritance. And even if it was inheritance, she had every right to claim that as herself. And even so, again, we mentioned the status of Fatima, peace be upon her, compared to the likes of Abu Bakr. And we can clearly see that no matter what she says, no matter her decision, she will always be in the right. So you have no reason to question her. If you question her, you question the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. So regarding that, of course, Abu Bakr is wrong. That's the reason why, of course, all of this dispute happened and everything with um, Fatima, peace be upon her, passing away angry as well, um, with obviously connections to having to pay allegiance to an illegitimate caliph of the time, self-appointed. Yeah, and to go back to when you said uh, they believe that the Prophet doesn't inherit, for example, they don't leave inheritance and they don't inherit. When we can find in the tafsirs of Ahl Sunnah, you can say, and at least like 12 tafsirs, for example, in uh, Tafsir Kashaf, volume 3, page 140, or uh, the Tafsir uh, of uh, Gharab, Gharab al Quran, part 18, page 88, for example, where it clearly says that uh, Prophet Sulaiman uh, inherited his father's worldly positions. <laughs> so, how come that Sulaiman uh, inherited both kingdom and knowledge, as they say in uh, Tafsir Dura Mantur? But Fatima Zahra, apparently, the Prophet cannot leave any inheritance, like the Prophet of all Prophets, by the way. Cannot leave exactly. any inheritance. To exactly. Yeah, to it just comes back to the point of just being extremely ignorant, choosing and picking who they want to follow. And, you know, any reason for them to put people who are worth nothing over the Lady of Heaven. Um, other than that, it's a question that we should be asking the opposition side anyway, which they can't seem to answer. Um, it's been asked many times, they can't really seem to have a straight answer, it's always around the bush or something, which is with most of their refutations, if you can say. Other than that, you know, it just comes back to the other points, like, for example, Ghadir, Kli, Walaya right there, why do they ignore that, why do they twist that? And every other hadith, for example, that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, has put forth about the Ahlul Bayt, and of course, the verse of purification where it clearly states it's just a family. So it's just plain ignorance at this point, really. How do you feel that when we bring up the killing of Fatima, the martyrdom of Fatima, alayha, that they start to attack Imam Ali alayhi salam and claim that we, we're calling him a coward? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. He has a will from the Prophet himself which says that um, this, this will happen, but it will also test your patience. If the numbers are enough, you can rise. But if not, then stay patient. So, you know, at the end of the day, Imam Ali alayhi salam is just following the orders of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. And again, if we look at the, you know, the killing of, for example, 
the Maya as well. These things had to happen, in, these sacrifices had to happen in order for Islam to continue. Just like the sacrifice of Imam Hussein, of Imam Hussein uh, peace be upon him, that had to happen in order for Islam to continue. And uh, there's no link of Imam Ali being a coward because we've seen him in battles. He's not like certain others who run away. Uh, the only man who truly, truly followed the Prophet's words, even after he was poisoned and killed by his own wife. And let's not also forget that in their own hadith book, Prophet al Athami records in uh, Simtan Nujum, volume 2, page 391, that Ali and Umm Ayman testified before Abu Bakr that Allah's apostle granted fa- Fadak to Fatima and that Abu Bakr uh, rejected this testimony. When <laughs> And wouldn't this also be a hint of uh, being a Nasabi. I see have another hadith that says the Prophet said al haqqum Ali wa Ali al haqq It's beautifully linked to almost anything that that obviously no matter what happens the truth will always be with Imam Ali peace be upon him during his time and after his time as well to this day so even if the whole world is against him the only truth that's standing is Imam Ali peace be upon him and, and also the fact that Abu Bakr uh, demanded witnesses is also proof that he didn't deny that Fatima was supposed to control the land. Exactly. And of course, um, there was another moment where on his deathbed, um, he mentioned a few things that he regrets. Was one of them, one of it was that he, um, obviously the, the killing of Fatima, peace be upon her, you know, ordering the attack mm-hmm. was one of the regrets. But why do you believe that these uh, the Sunnis have all of these ahadith? recorded and authenticated but yet they either decide to just find copes or just weaken them well it one of the points as i mentioned is of course ignorance another is the fact that they don't want to get out of their comfort zone for example if i link this to myself um few years back i of course i was born into a shia family alhamdulillah my parents taught me a lot um of my beliefs but i also had to find some stuff on my own as everybody does in their own journey but i also had you know these sunni kind of beliefs um i was even questioning the way i was praying um putting the turba for example saying ya ali shirk and all of that stuff mm-hmm. these questions we all tend to have so what the uh, opposition does is that they brainwash you with content that is far away from the Ahlul Bayt as much as possible so that your focus is rather on the people who are their killers, their enemies, the Prophet's enemies, ultimately God's enemies. So by doing that, they are able to put these people into your head, making them sound like they are higher than the true people who were supposed to follow. So some of these ignorant people tend to just listen to that, don't do their own research. Even if they do their own research, they tend to look for excuses. You know, for example, um, the Battle of Jamal, as we mentioned before, Aisha waging war against Imam Ali, peace be upon him, clearly. These are all excuses for Aisha. They bring forth that, you know, it was just ijtihad and they were having a little, they make it sound like a little picnic that in fact they were both in the wrong or that um, it wasn't Aisha's fault and there was a third party that made it all happen and everything. No, at the end of the day, millions or thousands of people were killed under the hands of Aisha and you need to question yourself. It's not a, it's not a small issue. These things are going to be asked no, at the end of the day and you need to pick your side basically let's not also forget that uh, Fatima Zahra السلام, also died angry with Abu Bakr yeah as we mentioned before as well which is a and, big big part and this is found in uh, Bukhari and ironically enough it's also narrated by Aisha herself <laughs> That's, that is very ironic she tends to okay we'll go into Aisha another time but at the end of the day, we Shias need to really think and reflect on the path that we are on. Do you want to continue suppressing the oppression that happened against Lady of Heaven? Or do you want to rise and do you want to take her as your inspiration to speak up about the roots of terrorism and about the roots of everything evil that is happening 
uh, today, for example, we have a head. And uh, let's not forget also, if I can just add to that, yes. that they are also the most uh, beloved to the Messenger of Allah was Fatima and Imam Ali. Uh, peace be upon them, of course. They tend to twist that, upon... right? They tend to say that, no, it was actually Aisha and Abu Bakr. Yeah, they even weaken the hadith. If you go into uh-huh. sunnah.com, for example, you can find it and it's a uh, graded life by Dar es Salaam. We all they... know this uh, exactly. company. Exactly, Nasibi. Nasibi company. They make Very it weak. Nasibi company. That's about that, Ahlul Bayt. Yeah, and I um, I completely agree with uh, you, Sister Sabur, and it was a pleasure having you on the Shia podcast. Is there any last words you would like to say before we wrap this up? Because we have been out of time. Yeah, it, it feels a bit strange being on the other side of the podcast and not, you know, listening to the guest speaker <laughs> and me being the guest speaker and everything. But it, <laughs> it was an honor to come here and speak about... Lady Zahra, peace be upon her, and you know we I need to come. We need to do our duty in continuing her message, not letting her martyrdom be in vain, and be a source of pride for her, especially us women. We need to we need to take inspiration from her to be strong women who don't fear, you know, the opposition or anything, and speak up about it. Inshallah, will be. Fine. Yeah. I I remember becoming a strong woman, so I can speak up about that. Said. Well, of course, you can also learn a lot from. <laughs> yeah, so we um, thank you for bringing time out of your day to come on the podcast. And, uh, My pleasure. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, watching this episode of the Shia podcast. We wish you all a good day or a good night and don't forget to subscribe comment and share the video with yeah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh wa muhammad wa al muhammad allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad ahjir farajahu allahu akbar la fayka haydar ali 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 ali